All right, Pastor Michael Rote here from Glory Bound Baptist Church, uh, continuing on with our short little series here uh, on alcohol. And uh, we've talked about uh, in episode number one, uh, where Jesus turned the water into wine. Uh, we talked about number two. Uh, episode, in episode number two, uh, about did they really have to uh, to drink wine in biblical times because they had no clean sources of water? We talked about those things. Uh, Jesus turned the water into wine was a picture of salvation, uh, and uh, it was untainted wine, unfermented wine, because Jesus couldn't wash our sins away uh, with tainted blood. It had to be pure blood. Uh, and then the argument of, well, they had to drink wine in biblical times because there was no clean sources of water uh, is absolutely false because we talked about Jacob's well and mentioned all kinds of other wells mentioned uh, in the Bible uh, that many may even still exist to this day. And, uh, and so that, those, those arguments don't work. And uh, so number three today, the episode number three, I just want to give you some facts, the facts of wine fermentation in biblical times. Uh, just some facts on that. In ancient times... Uh, there were several ways of preventing fruit juices from fermentation. And so this allowed them to have non-alcoholic wine throughout the year. Uh, so when a lot of time people, when they hear wine, uh, the word wine, they automatically think of the fermented wine that is so popular and, and everybody drinks today. Uh, what they fail to realize is that in those times, back in those days, even juice was referred to as wine. And, uh, and they did have methods of preventing juices um, from fermenting. And they had methods of, if a juice fermented, how to reverse that process. And so I want to talk about here today just for a little bit. In ancient times, there were several ways of preventing fruit juices from fermentation. And so this allowed them to have non-alcoholic wine, non-alcoholic wine throughout the year. Uh, here's just, uh, just a few methods of preventing fermentation. Uh, one method involved uh, boiling the juice and reducing it to a syrup. Uh, that could later be diluted with water. So what they would do is they would take the take the uh, the juice. They would take the grapes or whatever it was is making their juice out of, and uh, you know they would squish the grapes up or or squeeze the juice out of the fruits, and they would have the fruit juice. And then what they would do is they would take that juice and they would bring it to a boil, uh, and they would boil that that juice. And, and, and boil it long enough that where the, most of the uh, the water, the liquid in it, uh, would evaporate, leaving it in, in a syrup form. Uh, and then they would take that syrup and they would put it in a container. Uh, and then what they would do is later on they could take that syrup out uh, and, and dilute it down, mix it with water, and have juice. Same concept as if when you go to uh, McDonald's or Wendy's or, or someplace like that or go into a convenience store that has fountain drinks. The way those fountain drinks work is when you push when you take your cup and you push that little lever in for it to dispense your 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 Coca-Cola, your Pepsi, your Mountain Dew, whatever it is that you're drinking, what that is, there's actually there's a bag of syrup that's in there. And then there's carbonated water. And when you push that lever, the syrup and the carbonated water are then blended together and comes out the nozzle into your cup to make the soft drink. Okay, so what it is, it's in syrup form. And then there's carbonated water, and those two mix together to make the soft drink. It's the same concept uh, they had back then. Uh, they would take this fruit juice, and they would boil it and reduce it down to a syrup. And then they could later take that syrup and add water with it, and they would have non-alcoholic wine. They would have their juice. Uh, another, method, mo another method was to boil the juice with minimum evaporation and then immediately seal it with beeswax in an airtight jar. So what they would do is they would take and boil it, and a, that heating process would, would would help keep it from being fermented, and they would do it with very minimum evaporation. So it would still be in liquid form, still be in the juice. But as soon as they did it, they didn't allow it time to sit and for oxygen to get to it. They would take uh, boil it down uh, and, and with minimum evaporation, and then immediately, as soon as they got through bringing it to a boil, they would put it into a container and seal the top of the jar of the container with beeswax so it would have an airtight seal so that air so the oxygen couldn't get in there and cause the fermentation process to begin. Uh, also, here's another one. Also, they would dry the fruit in the sun and then add water and sulfur or filter the juice to extract the gluten to prevent fermentation. Uh, they would what, So what they do is they would take and dry the fruit out in the sun. And, and what they would do is they take it 
and once they were dried out, say say it was grapes, they would take the grapes and they would sit them out and let them dry out into the sun, uh, and then they would take and pound those and grind them into like a powder, and then they would add uh, a little bit of sulfur uh, to that, or when they were uh, or or when they would run it through, add water, they would filter it through to, and it would, what it would do is extract the gluten, which would keep it from getting fermented. And so when I think about this, them drying it out in the sun, uh, it's kind of like uh, the, the little flavor packets that we get for our bottles of water today. Uh, one of my favorites is the, uh, is the grape or the orange crush uh, because there's no sugar. Uh, but you can take those, those packets, and it's orange-flavored or grape-flavored, uh, but it's in powder form. Then you just add it to the water and shake it up, and guess what? You've got an orange-flavored drink or a grape-flavored drink. Uh, they do it with tea as well, and different flavors, uh, and it's kind of the same concept there. And then what they would do also do is if juice had already fermented, if the juice for some reason they had some juice and they didn't go through these processes, they just squeezed the juice out of the grapes or, or out of whatever what fruit you have, uh, and they squeezed the juice out of it and they just didn't do any of these processes, and the juice sat around and it fermented and became alcohol. They could take that fermented alcohol, that take that juice that had already fermented, and they can boil it, and then that would eliminate the alcohol. The heat would eliminate the alcohol. So there's four methods that I've just given you from, uh, from ancient times of ways of preventing fermentation or reversing fermentation. So they didn't have to drink fermented uh, wines. And how do I know that? unfermented like grape juice or things like that things that wasn't fermented like just regular old fruit juice was referred to wine in those times I want to share this with you uh, unfermented wine was also mentioned in ancient literature by great and well-known writers and philosophers now these these writers and philosophers their ideals may not have aligned with scripture but they were great thinkers they're well known and they were from that time period from way back in the Bible times even before Christ uh, and there are things in literature that they wrote that, that still exist today that proves that they called it wine back then and proves that they had unfermented wine and actually many of them preferred the unfermented wine. Here's a quote from Aristotle. Uh, the, he said this, Aristotle said this, the wine of Arcadia was so thick that it was necessary to scrape it from the skin bottles in which it was contained and to dissolve the scraping into water. So there's Aristotle talking about the wine of Arcadia and talking about, he's basically referring to one of these processes that I just mentioned to you, how that what they would do was boil it down to a syrup and that they would literally have to go inside the skin bottles and scrape the syrup out and then dilute it, dissolve it in, in into water so that it could be drinkable. Uh, Horace, Horace said this, uh, there is no wine sweeter to drink than that of Lesbos. It was like nectar and would not produce intoxication. So here we see Horace, he's talking about, he's, he refers to it as wine and says that there was none sweeter to drink than that of Lesbos. And it was like nectar and would not produce intoxication. So it was unfermented wine. Uh, the Mishnah, uh, it's a collection of oral Jewish traditions. Uh, and in the Mishnah, uh, it states that the Jews were in the habit of drinking boiled wine. So with it being boiled, it would be totally free of alcohol. So that tells me that the biggest majority of times when wine is mentioned in the Bible when they're drinking, and especially when it pertained to Jesus Christ drinking wine, he wasn't drinking fermented wine. He wasn't drinking wine that brought forth intoxication. Okay, It was fruit juice. And it may have gone through these processes that I've shared with you today. And we have proof of that, not only throughout history, but um, even by some great philosophers and writers, Aristotle and Horace as example, examples here. Uh, and the Mishnah, the collection of oral tradi Jewish traditions, talks about how that they were in the habit of drinking boiled uh, juices uh, free of alcohol. And so uh, that to me proves even more so that when the Bible talks about wine 
uh, when it talks about Jesus drinking wine or others drinking wine, uh, that in most of these cases, especially pertaining to Jesus Christ, uh, that it was unfermented, unintoxicating wine. It was fruit juices. Okay, uh, So uh, that right there should shoot down the argument of alcohol is okay to drink. It's not. It's, it's unscriptural. Uh, it's unbiblical. It is a sin.